Hello friends, it's Jen Quintana here. I uh, wanted to update everyone on um, how I'm feeling since I completed my Transcendental Meditation class last week. Um, the class was a four-day class, and some of you may have heard uh, one of my earlier podcasts where I talk about meditation and all the types of meditation that I love, um, but I did mention that I'd never been trained in Transcendental Meditation, and so now I have. Um, Transcendental Meditation is a form of meditation that was brought to the United States by uh, Maharishi, who was an Indian guru in the 60s who came to the United States, and he had been trained uh, by some teachers in India. He was part of an upper caste family from India, um, and he had spent some time with um, some teachers, and he gave all the credit for Transcendental Meditation to his teacher, who he lovingly called uh, Guru Dev which a lot of um, Indian gurus are called Guru Dev. So it's not of a specific person necessarily that we could trace back, but there is a picture of Guru Dev um, that people who practice transcendental meditation uh, respect. And, um, and there's a saying, uh, Jai Guru Dev, which means uh, rejoice um, in Guru Dev and Dev is short for, really for devotion, I think, or devoted. Um, so I went to this training and it was here locally in Los Angeles. There's a few centers around Los Angeles. Um, and I worked with a personal teacher, which is how transcendental meditation is taught. It's taught one-on-one -on -one, and the person who teaches you has to have gone through an extensive teacher training. Um, I think now they say the teacher training, uh, you have to go to India for five months to become a transcendental meditation teacher. So I will not be coming a transcendental meditation teacher. Uh, because I don't think I could leave my children and family for five months. But um, I do appreciate the commitment um, that these teachers have taken. And the teacher who trained me was trained by Maharishi himself. Um, and uh, the way Transcendental Meditation works is that you're given a mantra that's personal to you. Um, you're asked not really to share it, but a Google search can find a list of mantras. Uh, I think they're kind of given out by gender and age and depending on who taught you. Um, so I have my mantra. Um, and I was, um, I watched a little ceremony that my teacher did to give respect to Guru Dev. Um, I was asked to bring flowers to the first meeting and a white handkerchief um, and some fruit. And so they kind of made an open table um, and recited some Sanskrit verses uh, to the picture of Guru Dev uh, before we started. Um, and I know like for some people that might sound a little like spiritual woo-woo and especially if you're on a path where maybe you're not sure um, where you are with your spiritual beliefs, um, it can it, it can take you back a little bit. But for me, I loved it. I'm totally into that. So I just love any time that we can give respect to people who came before us, to the ancestors. I love all different kinds of cultural practices. Um you know, when you walk into a Vietnamese owned shop and they have, you know, a little altar for their ancestors there. I just think that's so um, special and important. Um, so, uh, so that's how it started. And I spent about an hour and a half with my teacher each day over the course of four days. Um, it was supposed to be kind of a group session, but I guess the other few people that had signed up kind of backed out. So it ended up just being a private class the whole time. Um, and the idea is that I would use this mantra to go deep into myself, um, and I am to do it 20 minutes every morning and every evening, and it, they consider it a lifetime practice. There's a lot of studies. They spent a lot of time in the training showing me all the results of these studies that they have done, um, showing how it reduces stress and improves health, and I believe that's true. I think probably all meditation, to some degree, can improve stress um, and health. Um, and I certainly know that mindfulness meditation has done some similar research studies and come up with those same results. Um, I got the impression though, that everyone there in the TM training center, um, they're very passionate about transcendental meditation and they were a little bit exclusive about it. It was very much like, this is the right way to meditate. <laughs> um, and it didn't really have a lot of openness to other, ways of meditating, they think that their way is the right way to meditate. And apparently the Maharishi taught them that um, this was a path towards enlightenment for the everyday person, um, and that it was really a, a meditation that people could do, even if they're working, um, if they don't know how to meditate, really it's a simple meditation. 
um, and that there's not a lot of thought that has to go into it or there's really no work that you have to do. You just have to carve out the 20 minutes twice a day. So I set aside a little bit some of the exclusive conversation things I kept hearing um, from them because I'm not an exclusive person. I'm kind of an inclusive person. I like to explore all different um, types of spirituality, and I really stay away from um, groups that are exclusive. So um, no judgment on them for that, but I did notice that a little bit. Um, so I did my meditation. I found it really hard to do it. One of the days that I was really busy, uh, we had people coming over in the evening. I had a few drinks at a barbecue, and so I just didn't really feel like I was in a good headspace to meditate, so I missed one of them um, during my four-day training. But I, I really tried to keep up with it. I felt kind of accountable to my teacher because he wanted me to report back to him every time I would come and meet with him, kind of how it was. So I, I told him I missed one and it was fine. Um, but I felt bad about it a little bit. Um, so since I've, since I have, I did find that the meditation did take me in deep, almost to the point where I almost like felt like I was in a sleep state sometimes. And I didn't really feel like I was getting a lot out of the meditation. But I did notice that right away on one of the first days, I went to a place in meditation that I've gone to before through the Enlightenment Intensive Retreats, um, where I was in a kind of a mermaid realm under the sea. And that's like a, that's something I've experienced before in a deep meditation. And so I realized that this transcendental meditation does take you very deep. So something that it would have taken me maybe three days to get to this kind of state of um, experience in meditation, um, I was able to accomplish in just a few minutes. Um, the rest of my meditations, I didn't have such a grand experience. It was kind of boring a little bit. And um, a little bit, I felt like I was almost asleep. Um, and they think that's good. Like for them, it's just that you're going to this really deep place. They consider it like a deep state of rest, like sleep almost, but you're still saying the mantra over and over in your mind. So you're not really asleep and you're sitting up, but your eyes are closed. Um, and as you're saying the mantra repeatedly without effort, um, you go into this kind of deep, um, peaceful state where you may or may not be conscious. Sometimes you forget if you're saying the mantra and when you become conscious of it again, you start saying it again. Um, so I did it for 20 minutes. They say you're in a really deep state, so you should take two minutes to come out of it. Like with your eyes still closed, stop saying the mantra, wait about two minutes before you really get up and start to do activity again. Because they say you don't want to go back into everyday activity without giving yourself a couple minutes to come out of that deep state. Um, this, you might have a headache or you just might feel a little groggy or something. Um, so that was my experience of it. It was a positive experience. Um, I have my personal mantra now. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to take up transcendental meditation every day for 20 minutes. I usually meditate in the mornings for an hour or so, and I do a different style of meditation. I do the Who Am I meditation, which I've shared before, and I really enjoy that one. Um, but I think if I don't have a lot of time, 20 minutes does sound like a good, um, a good way to just get some meditation in. Um, and the thing that I'm really curious about and that I want to study up on more is some of the teachings they kind of alluded to in the training, um, from the Maharishi, which I hadn't heard before. There were new teachings for me. Um, and so one of them is that he believed, or they believe that, um, dreams and thoughts are the product of our mind releasing stress. Now, I don't think all dreams and thought are that, but it's an interesting concept that when we have a lot of thoughts um, that we can't control, that we're under a lot of stress. And I kind of, you know, I notice, I always pay attention to that. Like when people are really unable to have some quiet in their mind, I do see that those are people who are under a lot of stress. And so whether they're homeless people or whatever it is, um, drugs could do that sometimes, but um, people even in like a really busy office environment sometimes have, have trouble just being quiet. Um, I go to a lot of events where there's just like silence and quiet. And it's interesting to know who has trouble with that. Um, so that was an interesting idea for me that thoughts and dreams can bubble up as a result of your body releasing stress. 
Um, so the more thoughts and dreams that are bubbling up, the more stress you're releasing. And it goes to where you really want to release all of the stress that your body is experiencing or has experienced until you get to this place of purity. And I've read about purity as a concept in other um, Eastern religious works, as well as um, there are some texts in Catholic works that talk about purity. Um, in a book I just read, God is Mother, talked about purity being a necessary um, component of reaching enlightenment. Um, and so this was very interesting to me, um, something that I really haven't had a chance to understand before. And so I want to read Maharishi's perspective on that. I have to see if he has any lectures that have been written down that I can read um, because I really want to understand that concept a little better um, since I'm really trying to achieve this thing called enlightenment in this lifetime. Um, my TM teacher, Transcendental Meditation, they call it TM a lot. Uh, my TM teacher said, that there, you know, there's this known path to enlightenment on this path that Maharishi laid out. Many other philosophers have paths towards enlightenment. Um, I don't think there's just one way to get there. But it was interesting. He had really outlined for me, the teacher had really outlined for me um, what the path is that Maharishi laid out and kind of where I'm at on that path. I was I was kind of glad that he recognized that I was on the path. He said, it still might, I might not reach enlightenment in this lifetime, total enlightenment. There's several steps to it, according to Maharishi, and so maybe in the next lifetime. Um, but I'm really hoping for this one. <laughs> and, um, and so I really want to read what he said about it and, um, and see if I can integrate that into all the other different philosophies that I've read. Um, I do find that there's truth in all different perspectives, and I think that at some point I'll be able to um, integrate kind of this perspective now into everything else that I've read and just have a deeper understanding of what's going on. There's also, um, curiously, there's an, a university in the United States, I think it's in Iowa, um, that was founded by Maharishi. They give degrees, they're a nonprofit school, they're accredited. Um, and uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that Maharishi had this desire to have. Um, a certain percentage of the Earth's population gather at this university center um, to do meditation together. And because he knew that if um, a certain percentage of the population were to meditate together, um, you could really then uh, impact the rest of the population that wasn't meditating. Um, and it was a path towards peace on Earth. And I do, I do find that that um, resonates with me. So um, there's a study called the hundredth monkey effect. Um, you can look it up on Wikipedia, but the idea behind it is that if you teach a hundred monkeys, it's not an idea. It's actually a study that was done. These scientists went to an Island. They taught 100 monkeys how to wash their food before they ate it. And once they taught a hundred monkeys on this Island, how to wash their food before they ate it, all the monkeys were washing their food before they ate it. And even monkeys on the neighboring Island who hadn't intermixed with the monkeys on this island were starting to wash their food before they ate it. And so it's a, it's a part of collective consciousness. Um, and they found it in this scientific study. They call it the hundredth monkey effect, um, where if enough people are doing the same thing, then the collective consciousness will go out and everybody will do it. So um, I've tied this kind of concept back to a scripture in Revelation um, that I never really understood as a child, but um, when I was taught it, but there's a number in Revelation of 144,000. And um, another philosopher explained that number as being the number um, of people on earth who would have to become enlightened in order for the whole population to evolve. And um, so maybe 144,000 was, I forget what the percentage is, like 1% or whatever of the population at that time. Um, so it was kind of a magical number. Like if we can get to this critical mass, then everyone's consciousness will evolve as a result of the work of the 1%. It's a different spin on 1%, right? Um, so that's what I learned in my Transcendental Meditation class. I'm going to go to a group um, TM class on Thursday evening, and I'll try to type into the notes here, like an update after I have that experience. Everybody says that it's really super powerful um, to join a group meditation with TM. 
And I'm sure that's true because I found that group meditation and other forms of meditation are super powerful. So I, I believe it's true. I'm very curious to have the experience and see what I notice from it. So that's it. Transcendental meditation. I am a, a trained TMer now. I have my own personal mantra. Um, and it's kind of opened up a new line of inquiry for me that I'm curious about. I will share more when I know more. Thank you for joining me. This is a short one, 15 minutes. Uh, hopefully by the next time we'll have a better camera. I keep on promising that. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, also check out my website so you can see I put up a new blog about house numerology. So if anyone's interested in numerology, you might find that interesting. Um, and then the kids have been out of school for a few weeks. Um, so I've been a little behind on my podcast, but I hope to get back to that right away because I want that to be a weekly thing. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks for chiming in.